Hey everybody, this is Andy, uh, former president of RMBS here with uh, Backcountry Dan and uh, Evan Thomas, one of the RMBS members. Um, we had a request from the, the board of directors to put together just a brief piece of content about um, springtime in the Rocky Mountains as far as uh, bonsai horticulture goes. This is a very um, exciting time in bonsai um, and it's also a very difficult time um, and one that I think uh, needs some explanation to be successful. So this video is geared for um, people who are new uh, to bonsai, relatively new, uh, that I expect to learn a few things from uh, from Backcountry Dan as well. So um, even if you're an intermediate or potential expert, there's some going to be some good concepts for you here. So um, so because we're the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society, we um, do the art of bonsai in the Rocky Mountain region, which has got a very cold and arid climate. So there's some uniqueness to being able to protect your trees in the winter um, and provide them the required amount of dormancy that they're going to need. So we're going to discuss uh, just very briefly some of those strategies, but we're going to focus on actually bringing our trees out of dormancy, which is a really dangerous time. So um, welcome, Dan. Uh, you want to just quick inter introduce yourself? Thanks. I'm Dan Wiederich, just up here in Wyoming. And in full swing with the bonsai shuffle in and out with trees right now so it's a good time to talk about it but. that's right all right the backcountry shuffle uh, i'm in denver colorado so is uh, evan so we're in the doing the denver bonsai shuffle right now so um dan can you tell us a little bit about um where your trees spend the winter maybe to start what kind of environments they might be in yeah um so most of my boxed trees trees that aren't designed or anything that are hardy stay outside next to a fence um just kind of keep the wind down but I let them have sun and, and all that and then pile snow on them when it's dry or when we have snow and then let it water them. So those are, those just kind of fend for themselves in spring. Um, the rest stay in a cold garage. Um, just up here, I choose to protect them as much as I can. So they stay in a cold garage. And then this time of year, they start waking up and I, I have to start moving them out into, into the sun on nice days and back in in the fall or i mean in the at night so mm -hmm. yep. yeah so what i'm hearing is some of your larger conifers your native material might stay outside in a protected area um typically like a north side of a house or a fence which i've utilized as well and having the trees um actually sitting on the ground um which i think just a really specific statement there having your trees not on a bench or elevated really does add some temperature to the to the base of the tree and helps to keep the roots from uh freezing solid yeah. Um, so what kinds of things would you, would you consider putting in the garage versus leaving outside? Are there certain species or certain things, conditions, like a tree that maybe was repotted last year, maybe was wired recently? Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Anything that was worked last year, um, anything that's not particularly hardy. I mean, like Japanese maples, I have quite a few of them and I don't, I don't let them stay outside in the winter here. They stay inside. Um, but even, you know, just any more, any of my more valuable trees anymore stay, stay in the garage too, even if they are hardy, just because I can, I can control the environment a little bit more and not have to stress about anything else. But, you know, we have, we have several members up here who, have, we, every one of us has a different approach. One guy, pretty much all of his, his collected trees, whether they're in a bonsai pot or in a collecting box, they stay out. Um, usually for us, we do the the east side of a fence because you know we don't mind the sun on them but we don't want the wind usually comes out of the out of the west northwest during the winter here and in, in the spring so um keep the wind off of them and then that also fence usually kind of acts as a a snow catch and so the snow will build up there over the trees which is perfect that also cool. about temperature and how do you manage how do you manage lighting in the garage um, I put up some extra lights and I also have three windows in the garage, which is rare for a garage. But, um, I've got two big windows on the east side that get quite a bit of light in the morning. And then one on the west side that gets it towards the end of the day. And then I put up some, um, usually LED lights or what I've been using lately, just big bars, um, just to add light through the day and I, I stuck a timer out there this year so the trees aren't subject to my ability to remember to go turn them on and off so I just kind of set that up and turns on with sunrise and off with sunset basically all winter long so 
that's worked out pretty well. Cool. Um, I've, you know, I've used my unheated garage too. It just has a north facing window. Um, so my main strategies for wintering my trees are um, sort of on the ground, protected from wind. You know, I'll heal my stuff in with some mulch up into the rim of the pot, not typically over the pot. Um, just so I'm able to water and have confidence that the water is actually penetrating into the container, not just running off the top of the mulch, uh, which is a mistake I've made in the past. Um, I uh, use my unneeded garage for uh, things like Japanese maples or per, per elms or other deciduous species that may be a little more sensitive. Redwoods, things like that might be a, a cold garage sort of situation. And I also have an outside cold frame, which is uh, basically a cinder block um, square that I've made that I've dug down with gravel in the bottom that has a, a lid that comes down. It's a clear lid, but that's a really nice environment too. So yeah, cool. you have a cold frame, you have a hoop house, right? Um, you know, I just use my hoop house as a, a shade structure in the, in oh, the cool. winter, so, or in the summer. So yeah, I don't hardly keep anything in there in the winter, but it does help awesome. block wind from, from the north side of where I keep trees outside. But yeah, and I know, Evan, you do the same thing that we do with the trees on the ground, sort of healed in, protected from wind, and you utilize your garage as well, huh? Yeah, I I use my garage for my deciduous, and then all my natives, I bury into the ground, but my house is a bit unique. On the south side, there's sort of lots of nooks and crannies that I can sort of get a lot of shelter, and I, I think getting some heat off the house as well, um, so sort of jam yeah. them in the, around the right next butted up to the house which helps a lot i've heard of some people having a really good success in a window well too if you have a basement with an accessible window well um, that'll keep your trees um, nice and cold allow the dormancy and keep them really out of the wind and then you know if you can slide the window open and water them and check them that's the way to go so um, a good rule of thumb just for d dormancy for most species is 40 days below 40 degrees is often a good good number to keep in mind so stuff doesn't need to be frozen solid but it does need um, a good amount of uh, low temperature to induce dormancy for uh, a lot of the species that we work with so um I wanted to, to shift the conversation a little bit to the sort of issue at hand uh, this evening, because I think we could talk about strategies for wintering um, material here probably for a week and talk to people and people do all sorts of different things and have had good success. Um, but, you know, Dan, what I find is uh, the, the stuff that I keep in my garage, it stays much warmer um, and the trees respond as the temperatures start to come up um ambiently and then also the daylight length and and they're always the first things to start budding in my garage and unfortunately you know i i've got a japanese maple that consistently comes out in february every year starting to push buds um and i've got stuff that's coming out in march and you know in denver that can be an issue because i'd rather not leave it in a dark garage i'd like to have it in the sunlight have it wake up have it photosynthesize try to keep the inner node length small um, short, keep the leaf size small rather than getting this big leggy tree that I just let grow in a dark garage. Um, but as I move them outside, you know, if I leave them there, they're subject to freezing, which will kill the buds, which can potentially kill the tree as it comes out of dormancy. So, so I wind up doing this thing that we all refer to as the bonsai shuffle, where I'm moving stuff out of my garage during the day, watching the, watching the temperature like a hawk, seeing what it's going to be at night. And if it's for me, if it's below 36 or 35 degrees, I've got stuff back in the house that's starting to butt out. So, um, Dan, I know this is a really common issue for you, too. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your strategies for the stuff that maybe is waking up early? Yeah, absolutely. That's the same thing that I don't think of a lot of people when they're starting out are aware of. Like, you know, we want small compact leaves and short inner nodes like you mentioned and and if the trees wake up in in the dark or in the shade or anything like that you're going to get leggy long growth big leaves trying to collect as much sunlight as possible all the opposite things that we're looking for in bonsai so um you know i think it was february when several of my maples and elms and those started waking up chojubai all that stuff started waking up in late february so just as soon as I have nice days, you know, at least above 40, generally I'll start shifting those things that are waking up. I'll stick them out on a bench or um, if they're bigger trees, I build carts with wheels that I can just kind of wheel out of the garage and park them on the driveway and then wheel them back in. Because um, my situation currently, my garage is facing the front main road and which most people's are, I think. And 
I just don't. We haven't had a theft up here yet, but there's been enough happening in the Denver area and other places that I, even if we're not freezing at night, I, I still move my trees back in. So I'm doing a lot of shuffling right now. Everything goes out in the sun and then comes back in at night just because I, yeah. I don't want to lose something when I could have done something about it. But, um, and I mean, that's really just it. I don't, I don't play with the temperatures. If I'm dropping close to freezing, I move them back in. Even if the forecast says 35, 36, I've had it drop down to 28 when the forecast said it was going to be 36. So I just don't play with it. If, if it says it's going to be below 40 at night, I wouldn't mess with that anyway. Um, just because particularly like a maple, if you've got fresh buds opening up, leaves coming out, that's just going to hammer it. So um, just bring it back in at night, take it back out in the morning once the temperature is good. Um, that's the shuffle. <laughs> yeah. You know, and a lot of people don't know about this when they start buying material, particularly our newer members. And so they'll be like, oh, well, I, I love a ma I love maples and I'm on an elm tree and I want, you know, and they're buying a lot of these sensitive species, right, that, that look like beautiful bonsai. And they put them in a container, which also compromises their cold hardiness. And then all of a sudden they have six or seven trees that 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 are sort of subject to the situation the in and out of the springtime. Um, you know, I know people who have a hundred trees in their yard and they don't have to do this because they have species that are cold hardy that are native to the area. And so I think, you know, for people starting out thinking about some of these things, um, sort of being, being, um, having a little more forethought about it. Like, how am I going to winter for this? Do I have space in the garage for these six trees? Do I have some strategy? Am I going to be able to be available to be moving these trees in and out? I yeah. think this is stuff I didn't think about at all when I was a beginner. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think I've made mistakes in the past, whereas it's got warm and I've had trees that have survived the winter outside and then I put them up on a bench and then just forget about them overnight and they just um, they struggle. And I, I think as well, just putting them off the bench as well and um, when you start to notice those temperatures coming down um, really helps a lot. Yeah, and that's where, like, even if you have a, a limber pine that's perfectly hardy, if you've kept it inside a garage all winter long where it hasn't frozen and then you take it out in the spring and you said oh well it's hardy and it's already growing it's you know even though it's hardy to cold it's not gonna it's not gonna take that well when it's been pampered all winter and then and then all of a sudden you stick it out when it starts growing and it freezes so um kind of yeah I like that concept. So what are some, what are some indicators for folks who may be newer that um, would tell you that a tree has come out of dormancy and maybe had cold hardiness a month ago, but maybe doesn't now? What sorts of things do you see? Um, well, a conifer is just the buds start swelling and you start seeing a little bit of green, usually depending on the, on the species, but usually like pines, you'll see the buds just start to just swell. And then you see green in there before the, the needles kind of start to separate out of the bud. But as soon as you see that moving, you know it's moving out of dormancy. And it's still somewhat cold tolerant as the bud's swelling, but um, it's losing some of that tolerance daily as it, as it grows. Um, firs, spruce, it's all the, kind of the same. You see the buds swelling. Um, I guess everything, buds swelling yeah. is what you're, what you're looking for. And they'll start to drink a lot more water too once they start growing gangbusters and and then we get we get spring winds up here like crazy so you combine the trees moving with the spring wind and all that and you, you can have pots drying out awfully quick so it's another thing to watch as you're moving them out i think that's pretty important and um, pivoting to watering I mean, yeah during winter you're watering every so often and, and how i mean how do you do you mean you just need to check them daily i mean yeah. even twice a day Mm -hmm. more i think i water more in spring than i do in the middle of summer so just because because they're growing so much faster combined with winds and in you know, summer they almost go dormant a little bit again so they're not they're functioning but they're not growing at at spring speed so yeah, you know, and I, I think I do it to myself a little bit because certainly I've got stuff in the garage that's going to start to 
push buds. And I'm like, well, I guess it's going to have to go outside and I'm going to have to do the back and forth. But I'm real eager, you know, when the days get nice here, the fool's spring in the Rocky Mountains where you're like, oh, man, oh, yeah. I want to get some of these trees out on the bench. And so you start pulling your pines out from the protected area, you start pulling your junipers out, putting them up on the bench and they're getting good sun, right? Um, and then next thing you know, they're starting to grow. They're dropping their winter hardiness. And then we get four days of snow when temperatures are 28 degrees. And so, uh, you know, a more conservative approach would have been to leave them protected in the shade on the ground or in the, the gravel bunker, wherever you have them. I mean, I know Larry Jackal and some of the older members of RMBS who really know what they're doing. They'll leave stuff in the bunker till May. You know what I mean? Um, just to, to create that, um, that condition of forestalling that transition from dormancy as long as possible to give the tree as much protection as it can. Um, but, you know, it's, you get excited. Spring's here and you start moving stuff, yeah. you know? The more trees you get and the more you have to move, the, more, the smarter you have to get about it. <laughs> but, yeah. I, and then you, you learn your trees too. Like my, my lodgepole pines out of the conifers are always the first ones to, to start growing. So... So I'll start moving them out a little earlier. I really just, as they start growing, that's when I try to move them out. But, but then as the days get a little more reasonable, um, I'll start moving everything out. I would say most of my limber pines and ponderosa, they're just now starting to swell and look like they're gonna grow where the, the lodgepole pines already have little needles coming out. Um, some of the spruce too are already pretty far along, that type of stuff. But and all my deciduous now are awake and nearly fully leafed out. But, mm -hmm. um, but you'd mentioned when we had a little conversation about this um, earlier, sort of pests and disease. Um, so, you know, I've experienced, you know, fungal issues in my cold frame specifically when it stays too wet. But um, this, this sort of period um, from the, the winter to spring transition, I think is, is a danger zone for the trees from that respect too. Um, what sorts of things are you looking for? What are you thinking about? Um, and how are you treating them? Um, well, for starters, you know, through the winter, I try to keep everything, you know, watered well, but not, not too wet. And I don't want the, the you know, I want humidity in there, but not a crazy amount of humidity. And then if we have a nice, a nice day, even in the middle of the winter, I'll crack some windows or I'll even crack the garage door open just because I want airflow through there because that, that mitigates a lot of the, the disease issues and fungal attacks, that kind of stuff. So um, I'm kind of proactively working to prevent that all winter. And then springtime, the same way as they're growing, if they're still inside in a kind of stagnant air, um, you're going to see a lot more of that. So, so that's another good reason to be moving the trees out. And then also as you're handling trees and watching them grow and a little more interested, usually when they start to move in the spring, that's the time just to, just to watch. And, you know, you might see some leaves coming out a little wrinkly, or you might see a fungus growing on your soil or something. That's usually an indicator just to for me, I don't jump straight to anything like chemicals or anything like that. I just, I just go, oh, I need to pay a lot more attention to how much I'm watering that tree and maybe tip it up on an angle so it drains better with the water table like we saw in our video with Paul. Um, just try to make sure stuff isn't staying saturated, make sure the system's working like it should be. Balance the water and oxygen and the root mass. Um, those are all the most important things to, to keep airflow, um, fresh air around the trees, and then correct watering. And that'll usually solve most of the issues. Um, I won't jump into like which chemicals to use or any of that. I'm not even always entirely sure myself. I have to consult the professionals, but. <laughs> um, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that the airflow, because my cold frame, um, Every, the last two seasons, I've had one or two branches on Colorado blue spruce that will turn this purple color. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one or two little shoots. And it definitely, you know, I've talked to some of the other folks that know um, quite a bit about blue spruce as bonsai. And they say, you know, this is this is some sort of fungal thing. And um, I think what's happening is it's, it's too wet in my cold frame and staying too wet. So one thing I'll take away from this is if, if there's a nice day in the winter, maybe what I'll do is I'll prop open the lid of that cold frame and try to get some more air going through there. But it seems that at least my Colorado blue spruce are most susceptible to it. Um, 
you know, I do have some pine needle cast, but that doesn't really seem to be related to any of this that we're talking mm -hmm. about. It's just sort of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you get a nice date and it doesn't have to be much, just crack it open a couple inches and you'll get, you'll get air movement in there. So that'll make a big difference, I think. Yeah, there's a lot to think about with the bonsai shuffle, huh? <laughs> yeah, there's, you can go as deep as you want, I think, but. Well, so, fertilization this time of year. Oh yeah, um, I'm always pretty conservative. I let at least you know anything in really young stock or development. I'll, I'll start fertilizing as soon as they start growing. Um, but anything in a bones lay pot that I'm trying to refine or ramify, I'll just wait until it's fully leafed out, and then I'll start. You know doing some light fertilizing. So I, I just did my first round a couple days ago with some um, oh, fish emulsion and kelp on, on the deciduous trees that were fully leafed out that I thought needed some more, just a little boost or things that are flowering that, that I know need a boost, that kind of stuff. Um, so nothing with conifers or anything like that yet. So I'm kind of letting it, just letting it grow. Is there any brands you recommend? Um, you know, let's see. I've been using the last few years the Bio Gold as far as a uh, cake, and I haven't done any of that yet in the spring. It's pretty expensive, but it does seem to be good. I've also made my own with um, just gone and bought like a good organic fertilizer mix, and then you can mix a little bit of flour in there and and get it wet and really just put it in a pan, let it dry, cut it into squares before it gets too dry. And then that's worked pretty well. Um, but the last couple of years, it's the little extra money for the bio gold has saved a lot of time making fertilizer. So it's, it's just a, a choice there, but, um, and then no particular brand. I, I searched out after listening to a bunch of the bones on Mirai stuff, I searched out fish, hydrolysate, which is supposed to be a little bit better than fish emulsion. I've heard differing reports on whether people see actually see a difference there or not, but um, Amazon has all that kind of stuff. You just type in fish emulsion or fish hydrolysate and then kelp extract. And um, I think cold pressed kelp extract is supposed to be a little better. Again, I don't know. I haven't tested any of that, but just trying things out and that's all worked well for, for liquid fertilizer. That's what I use is, is some sort of fish and then the kelp extract. And that does well for me in between the cakes. Great. I, yeah. I think a few of us are using Dr. Earth's yeah, as well. It's slightly it. cheaper than bio gold. But yeah. I was using that as well. Yep. And I've results. just sprinkled that on. That works too. I haven't even, to think i don't think i've tried to make cakes out of that yet but i don't see why you couldn't yeah um one maybe last uh sort of uh introductory topic for our beginner folks since it looks like it's getting dark here in denver um is you know say this time of year is is an excellent time perhaps an ideal time to be repotting many if not most species of bonsai um so let's say like Last week, I repotted a Colorado spruce into a bonsai container um, from sort of a growing box. Um, and the tree stayed out all year. It did fine. It was outside. It was wintered outside. It was cold hardy. Um, but, you know, after you repot the thing, uh, this is one more scenario where you're going to want to protect it after you've done that. So if you happen to have a tree that's been cold hardy all winter, you repot it. Um, you've really compromised the root system and you, you're going to want to keep those new root tips from freezing. Um, and so that would be a scenario where you're going to want to protect that tree too. So, um, you know, th these are mistakes that I've made early on too, is I'll repot a tree and I don't have a plan or any place to keep it um, after I do that. And then, you know, I'm out there just sort of really with my fingers crossed, hoping it makes it through a freeze. Um, so yet another thing, I think you got to be really sort of uh, have some forethought about what 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 is the size I can replant? What am I going to replant now? Because I think that there are some folks that have really big material, right? And so if you have a really big old tree and you're repotting it, you got to have a plan to protect it if it's going to freeze or you got to keep it dormant long enough that you're going to 
pot it later in the season, right? Do you think that's sound advice, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just did the same thing. Um, we've been we've been working. I've been repotting for a, oh, a solid month now, and um, we've also had Ryan Neal and Todd Schlafer have both been up here working trees, and um, you know it's the same with with wiring and styling. If you do a bunch of bending on branches and the trees working on you know fixing little tears or things like that in the branches, you're get, if that freezes, that's going to be a good chance you're going to lose those branches. Um, so I had a a really big limber pine we just worked on, and I mean we. We split part of one branch out and bent that over double. We did, oh, probably four or five wedge cuts on the tree oh, and all wired every branch. So, I mean, I just had to make sure I had room in the garage to put that because if that freezes, I could, you know, I could lose that whole thing. And so it's just kind of planning ahead. So <laughs> make sure I have room because that, that was out all winter also up until about two weeks before Ryan came, I, I brought it up to make sure it didn't get, you know, frozen or, or rained on right before we went to work on it. But. Well, sweet, man. I, I saw that tree on your social. I think it's pretty amazing. Um, well, you know, I think this was, I think this is really useful. It's a deeper dive than I thought we were gonna, gonna do, but I think, you know, this is, this is the fundamental, you know, things that we're thinking about this time of year. So um, Evan or Dan, do you guys have any other sort of final thoughts or parting words of wisdom before we sign off tonight? Thanks, Dan. That was really good information on managing trees in this difficult transitional phase. A lot of the topics in the discussion were focused on gardens and garages. If you don't have access to these, it might be easier to focus on trees with a tropical variety. Feel free to ask any questions below in the comments. Thank you.